to uh, have Dr. Zhang uh, here in, in, the, uh, in person in the auditorium. And uh, uh, if you are here, again, you can enjoy the, 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 uh, uh, the small uh, uh, treat uh, we have. So next week, we will also have uh, the in-person uh, uh, seminar. So uh, please come here. And you know uh, we have a, 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 a snacks and the fruits available, and uh, so for today, um, you know, Dr. John. I'm professor at uh, Harvard Medical School, and also a uh, School of uh, uh, Public Health, and Associated Epidemiologist uh, over Brigham and Women Hospital. And his research covers a lot of uh, uh, diet, lifestyles, biomarkers, and uh, and uh, cancer, especially the uh, liver cancers. And she, her, his research, uh, you know, also involved the early detection of uh, liver cancers. And he has published uh, like uh, about like almost 100, 200 uh, uh, paper, scientific papers so far. So he's a very productive uh, uh, scientist. And his research uh, supported by the NIH and also by the American Cancer Society. So very high profile uh, uh, research. And he also served as a reviewer for the study session in NIH and the American uh, Cancer Society. And I feel like I uh, really have the pri pri uh, privilege to have Dr. Zhang here. And, uh, you know, I'm very lucky to, to be one co-author for one of uh, uh, his paper. And, uh, you know, we are also collaborating for another project. So, uh, so glad you, you are here. And uh, without further delay, I give the floor to Dr. Zhang. Oh, thank you, Dr. Ma, uh, for your nice introduction. Uh, thank you all for joining either online or in person. Uh, it's my huge uh, privilege and honor to be here today. Today, I'm going to uh, share some of the research studies, uh, uh, mainly from my group on liver health, uh, focusing more on the diet and lifestyle. Uh, first, I want to uh, touch base very briefly on my own research framework. Uh, as you know, I'm an epidemiologist. My interest uh, is to reduce the global cancer burden and disparities. I've been engaged uh, in the prevention efforts uh, across the continuum of cancer care, uh, ranging from the primary prevention by identifying new risk factors, elucidating the mechanisms, to the secondary prevention uh, in the context of uh, risk stratification and early detection, and lastly, among the persons with uh, cancers, how we can improve the quality of life. For today's talk, uh, I will give a quick overview about the burden of liver cancer and then share some of the uh, new risk factors we have been working on, um, especially on diet lifestyle, and uh, also briefly on environmental toxins. And lastly, I want to touch base on my uh, another area of research interest on health disparities and global health. To start with the overview about the liver cancer, unlike many other cancers with decreasing trend, uh, liver cancer incidence has been rising worldwide. Currently, liver cancer is the sixth most common type of cancer worldwide. Uh, because as you all know, liver cancer is a fatal disease. Uh, liver cancer is the third leading cause of cancer-related death. What we currently know about the major risk factors for liver cancer as summarized in this uh, slide, as you can see that there is a significant geographic variations in major known risk factors for liver cancer. For example, chronic hepatitis B virus infection, HPV infection is more prevalent in Asia and Africa countries comparing to the developed regions. In fact, this also explains that over 54%, 50 percent of liver cancer occurred in China can be attributable to HPV infection. In contrast, the numbers are only about 5% in the US. I think that speaks to not only the uh, significant heterogeneity of liver cancer in the context of uh, the etiology or risk factors, also uh, highlight the needs of uh, tailored prevention in different parts of the world. Now, uh, beyond uh, HPV or CV infection, I want to touch upon very briefly on other well-known risk factors. One of them is aflatoxin uh, contamination of foods. Uh, as shown in this slide, uh, about 50% of liver cancer in Africa 
attributable to aflatoxin contamination. But luckily enough, we don't have much cases attributable to aflatoxin in the developed regions, such as North America. Strikingly, there is a significant interaction between HPV and aflatoxin on liver cancer risk, comparing individuals without uh, aflatoxin contamination measured by the urinary biomarker and uh, uh, people uh, without HPV surface antigen, those with both have about 60-fold increased risk of liver cancer. Again, this speaks to the uh, importance of addressing the liver cancer prevention in the context of different etiology and the risk factor profile. Another well-known risk factor for liver cancer is alcohol, heavy alcohol consumption, as shown in this one of the most recent comprehensive study by the liver cancer print project, as you can see, people drink at least five drinks a day have about uh, uh, two-fold increased risk comparing those uh, with never drinking group. Uh, beyond alcohol, another commonly studied uh, dietary factor, um, likely a protective factor is coffee. Uh, as you can see by this most comprehensive study from the liver cancer print project, coffee consumption is associated with a lower risk of developing a liver cancer. In this case, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, one of the major type of liver cancer accounting for about 80 to 85% liver cancer. Another major subtype of liver cancer, we call it intrahepatic cholangic carcinoma, SCC, account, accounts for about 10 to 15% of cases. In this study, we did not observe any significant association with SCC. What's the current uh, uh, status of liver cancer burden in the United States? As we know, liver cancer has low incidence in the US historically, uh, however, uh, since the early 1980s, we have seen about threefold increase in liver cancer incidence without unknown or unclear reasons. Liver cancer has been projected to be the third cancer-related death by 2040, and also the etiological landscape of liver cancer in the U.S. has been changing uh, from viral to non-viral factors, especially the metabolic disease-driven uh, liver cancers. A liver cancer is a fatal disease, as we just discussed. Those are, uh, this cartoon shows the current uh, relatively well-known risk factors for liver cancer. Uh, in the US, uh, about 30% of the liver cancer cases cannot be explained by those uh, known risk factors, uh, speaking to the needs of identifying a new uh, risk factors. In terms of new risk factors, have been have strong interest in studying diet and lifestyle with liver cancer. This last summarize uh, the uh, is summarized by uh, the World Cancer Research Fund, American Institute for Cancer Research, one of the most comprehensive uh, uh, review of, on the uh, relationship between diet and liver cancer. As you can see from this slide, beyond aflatoxin, heavy alcohol drinking as risk factors, coffee potentially as a protective factor, most other diet uh, dietary factors are falling into the categories of limited evidence. To address this knowledge gap, my group has been uh, very interested in identifying new diet lifestyle factors. Uh, in addition to the sparse data in the field, there is a strong biological plausibility support the diet and lifestyle in liver carcinogenesis, as shown in this oversimplified cartoon, as you can see that dietary factors can impact different lifestyle factors, including but not limited to adiposity, uh, diabetes, all of which are closely related uh, to different biological and molecular pathways, including insulin resistance, inflammation, gut dysbiosis, hormone and lipid metabolism. All of these uh, mechanisms has been strongly implicated in different stages of uh, liver disease uh, development and progression. So now, uh, with the sparse data in the field and strong biological plausibility, I want to show some uh, very quickly about some of the dietary factors we have been working on. This just give you a quick a snapshot of uh, the uh, studies uh, uh, from my group uh, on the dietary factors on liver cancer. 
uh, I want just to show uh, very briefly a few examples. Before showing the data, I want to mention that I have been privileged to working with uh, different cohorts, including but not limited to the nurses' house study, has professional follow-up study, as shown in this slide. These are prospective uh, cohort study with a repeated data reassessment. And we have uh, been starting the incident primary liver cancer as an outcome. The first example I want to show is on whole grain and fiber. The reason being that whole grain and fiber has been found to be associated with lower risk of different disease endpoints, including diabetes, premature death, cardiovascular disease. In terms of liver cancer, at that time, we are only aware of one publication from European countries showing humor association with fiber. No study have looking at whole grain yet. So in this first population-based study, we have observed that 15 grams per day of whole grain intake is associated as about 10% about lower risk based on the study from nurse and health professional follow-up study. The 15 grams per day of whole grain intake uh, is roughly equivalent to about two uh, pieces of whole grain bread. We also observe some uh, uh, EMR associations with dietary fiber consistent with the only uh, European study at that time uh, uh, in the context of uh, EMR association with dietary fiber, especially cereal fiber and vegetable fiber, but nothing with the fruit fiber. Because the study was based on less than 200 cases, we further replicate this funding uh, based on another prospective cohort NHARP study, where we have included about over 900 incident liver cancer cases. And we still observe inverse association with whole grain um, fibers from uh, grains, beans, vegetable, but nothing from the fruits. So we are looking at the literature to see what uh, was there for fruits or vegetable in relation to liver cancer risk as shown in this recent meta-analysis that total vegetable intake was associated with lower risk, about 40%, comparing the extreme categories, but total fruits was not. And we further replicate this uh, meta-analysis results in a recent study um, uh, uh, from the ARP where we also observed that uh, vegetables uh, was associated with lower risk, uh, including the uh, uh, composite, uh, different subtypes of vegetables, including composite the lettuce is one of the major one, and also the lettuce and, uh, and cruciferous uh, vegetable uh, consumption. And recently I have, uh, uh, I've been aware of a study led by my colleague who have done the metabolic uh, profiles of long-term fruits of vegetable intake. Uh, uh, sorry for the small uh, font size, but one of those uh, metabolites named the pepperine was correlated with the lettuce uh, consumption. As you may recall from the last day, lettuce is higher consuming lettuce is associated with lower risk. Then I look at the literature, it seems that, oh, there are some existing laboratory or experimental studies linking the pepperine uh, contained in lettuce with liver cancer risk. That was really interesting. And I'm not, sp I'm not saying that peppering contained in lettuce can contribute to the inverse association. Um, I would like to bring your attention that integrating the multi-omics, uh, in this case, metabolomics uh, signature to uh, the study can help to elucidate some potential uh, mechanisms. Beyond looking at the solid foods, we're also interested in beverages. In this case, uh, we look at the relationship between sugar sweetened beverages, SSBs, uh, with uh, liver cancer risk. Sugar sweetened beverages is widespread. Over 40% of general population uh, have at least one cup of day of uh, uh, SSB intake. What we found is that um, higher sugar sweetened beverage consumption was associated with higher liver cancer risk comparing those with at least one throwing per day to never group, uh, we have observed about twofold increased risk after accounting for uh, the multiple uh, known risk factors. We did not see much association, we did not see any association with artificially uh, sweetened beverages, although the point estimate is about one. I think that was partially because um, in that population, when you have initiative the consumption levels of Artificially sweetened beverages at that time was um, much lower than the super sweet beverage. Beyond looking at the single uh, food groups, we're also looking at uh, uh, dietary patterns. In this case, 
uh, we hypothesized that dietary pattern influencing the inflammation associated with higher risk. To do so, we have uh, expanded the work based on Dr. Talon's um, uh, empirical uh, dietary inflammation pattern. Uh, uh, specifically, uh, we have identified 39 predefined food groups, some of which are listed here, like fried food, sodas, refined carbs, and processed meat are strongly uh, correlated with the inflammation biomarker, IL-6, CRP, and TN alpha. After derived this uh, inflammation pattern, we linked that to the risk of developing liver cancer in the population. We observed that uh, people in the top category has about twofold increased risk. I think suggesting that reducing the data inflammation potential can uh, reduce the risk of uh, developing liver cancer. Another interesting pathway is we have been studies on insulin resistance or hepcidinemia. In this case, we also uh, use the derived uh, dietary pattern for insulin resistance and also observe about uh, 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 higher risk uh, comparing top to top bottom categories. So again, the dietary factors, uh, uh, we can reduce in dietary uh, 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 infl uh, potential of insulin resistance can be beneficial for liver cancer uh, prevention. Uh, for the time of sake, I just give you a very quick examples of some of those dietary factors. We also look at other uh, nutrients or food groups, uh, including but not limited to polyunsaturated fatty acids. We see uh, immune association. We also see some borderline immune association between yogurt and liver cancer risk, as well as fish and poultry. We also look at other uh, guidelines uh, uh, related uh, dietary pattern. In contrast, we also see some uh, positive associations with other nutrients or uh, food groups, uh, including the uh, processed meat, high fat dairy, as well as several other uh, dietary uh, patterns. Uh, because a lot of liver cancer arises from liver disease, uh, in addition to study liver cancer, uh, uh, my group's another line of interest is to study liver diseases, including about limit, not limited to the narcotic fatty liver disease uh, now affects about 25% of US general population. Another severe form of the NIFOD is the NASH, alcoholic steel hepatitis, which is now the second indicator for liver transplantation uh, in the US. Uh, not only because of the prevalence of those fatty liver disease, and liver disease also contribute ranking about the ninth uh, uh, mortality, uh, liver disease mortality ranking ninth. So it's an important endpoint to study as well. In this study, uh, we have observed the inverse association between yogurt intake with uh, the lower chronic liver disease mortality. Uh, we see some borderline inverse association between yogurt with uh, liver cancer, but now we further see uh, the yogurt is associated with the chronic liver disease mortality. As you know, yogurt is uh, specific food uh, uh, of dairy foods like produced by milk, uh, by like seed acid producing bacteria. And in the literature, we have seen that uh, higher yogurt consumers have lower risk of developing uh, type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, and yogurt actually by Dr. Um, uh, Darren Mozafari um, a couple of years back showing yogurt is one of the strongest uh, food predictor for weight loss. So we did see a fair amount of interesting association between yogurt with uh, different disease endpoints. Clearly, uh, we, one of the limitations is that we don't know the types of yogurt, but in this population, uh, based on literature, it's more of the low-fat yogurt. Another concern is that maybe people eating yogurt more, uh, more likely to have healthy behaviors. In this study, we have adjusted for the known risk factors, uh, but the association is still there. And then we further try to elucidate the, the potential mechanisms underlying yogurt and GI uh, gut health. Um, we have observed that uh, higher yogurt consumers have lower levels of soluble CD14 concentrations. This biomarker is one of the surrogate or not perfect, the surrogate for gut barrier function. I think suggesting that yogurt may uh, interact with gut barrier function to confer potential uh, beneficial effects. I've been involved in my colleague's work on 
looking into the impact of yogurt with gut microbiome, I, my own has a uh, ACS grant to looking at yogurt with colorectal cancer by integrating the plasma metabolomics data. Hopefully we can have more data to, to see uh, how yogurt impact the gut health. Uh, in terms of the next step, I think uh, we need to continuously integrate genetics, modiomics, uh, including microbiome, uh, to elucidate the, the potential biological underlying mechanisms. Currently, uh, the studies on different stages of liver disease are very limited, uh, including alcoholic fatty liver disease or some severe uh, type of liver disease, such as cirrhosis. Uh, we need more study on that as well. And the study have presented are predominantly non-Hispanic uh, Caucasian population. Clearly, uh, the eating habits were culturally a different in diverse population. We need more study to look into how the diet and nutrition impact liver outcomes in the diverse population. We need to study, those studies have presented on adulthood uh, dietary intake. Clearly, uh, we need more study to look into either the multi-generation study or the early life dietary intake. For example, whether um, uh, the eating habits in the adolescence can have impact on future adulthood cancer risk development. And lastly, among the individuals already have liver diseases or even cancer, uh, whether uh, the dietary or nutritional factors can impact or improve the quality of life. I think in the context of uh, food as a medicine, camera cancer survivorship, hopefully the population-based uh, epidemiological studies can contribute to future uh, clinical guidelines uh, for other cancer uh, survivors. I think that wraps, wraps up uh, my examples showing some dietary factors. Now I want to touch base uh, briefly on other lifestyle factors. We know that vigorous type physical activity is associated with liver cancer risk. However, not everybody is capable of vigorous type physical activity. So the question we ask here, whether there is other types of physical activity may be uh, beneficial in, in the context of uh, liver cancer prevention. So based on the nurses' health study and health professional follow-up study, we have looked at the relationship between brisk walking, defined as I think 30 minutes of uh, walk uh, per day. We did find that uh, people engaged at least one hour a week of brisk walking uh, has about 40% lower risk. Uh, even after accounting for uh, known risk factors. We know we, that uh, higher adiposity, uh, excessive adiposity measure by body mass index is associated with higher risk of liver cancer. That's the case. This is one of the most comprehensive study uh, um, uh, BMI and physical activity from the liver cancer pooling project. People with uh, higher BMI have about two over twofold increased risk. And even more interesting is that even among the people with normal BMI uh, defined by 18.5 to less than 25, as you can see here, uh, per five centimeters increase in width circumference associated with about 14% uh, higher risk of developing liver cancer speaking to not overall adiposity, but where the fat accumulates uh, really matters. Now and we know that over 22% of US population is obese. Over 13 different types of cancer are associated with obesity. 40% of cancer diagnosed early each year are obesity related cancer. So I have the privilege to join the steering committee for a recently formed uh, metabolic dysregulation and cancer risk program uh, by NCI. Uh, they funded five individual uh, research studies in different institutions. I'm one of the multi PI in the Brigham Women Hospital and Harvard set, along with Dr. Tobias and John Nucci. What we are going to study is to decode the mechanisms underlying obesity on both colorectal and liver cancer. Uh, as we show that, uh, we found that greater visceral adiposity T cell and the glycemic metabolic dysfunction appear to be the main driver for 
the risk of uh, the increased risk we saw for both liver and colon cancer, but the mechanisms are remain unknown. So in this study, we hypothesized that there is a uh, signature or profile of circulating proteins. We call it uh, inflammatory types. Um, it can be specific to metabolic unhealthy obesity. We, once we derive the signature, we are going to link that signature to the future risk of liver cancer and colon cancer as well. The approaches developed here uh, clearly can be ap applicable to study other disease endpoints. Uh, for the sake of time, I only showed uh, quick examples on physical activity, uh, breast walking, and excessive adiposity. We have also been looking into other lifestyle factors. We do observe inner association with aspirin use, strong positive association with diabetes, a moderate association with gallstone disease and wall movement. And also we observe the U-shaped uh, uh, relationship between long and short sleep duration. This also speaks to uh, the, uh, the, the complicated etiology of liver cancer. Clearly it's a multifactorial uh, diseases. Uh, clearly we need more work to identify uh, the uh, other lifestyle factors. Um, now, uh, environmental pollutants. Liver is a major organ, not only for metabolism, but also for detoxification. So uh, environment, environmental pollutants is very relevant for liver health. And I'm not sure, but you, some of you may have seen the, uh, the headlines talking about the orange juice contaminated by one of the environmental pollutants named uh, PFAS recently. What is PFAS? PFAS is also called fiber chemicals. It's a group of man-made chemicals, highly resistant in both the environment and human body. And PFAS are colorless, odorless, tasteless. And we are all exposed to PFAS from the daily basis through the drinking water, food packaging, nest gig cookware in the general population for the people working in the fire, uh, firefighters or high risk population because the foams uh, contain a high concentrations of uh, PFAS. And there is some mounting concerns from the, the scientific community, policy makers and the public. Uh, for example, the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IARC, and the US Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, has uh, outlined, like for example, suggestive evidence of carcinogenesis of PFAS. And also PFAS contamination has been uh, increasing. And uh, some data uh, even 2019 showed that about uh, uh, 600 locations in 43 states are known to be PFAS contaminated. The NHS data suggests that over 90% of the US general population have detectable uh, PFAS levels. And then in Massachusetts, I think uh, two years ago, they have some news uh, concerning the effect of uh, PFAS uh, contained the pesticide use uh, in the Massachusetts. You may also see some news on uh, containing the water in the Cape Cod area, for example. Clearly, it's a significant public health concern. And then uh, one of my postdocs, Cindy, has recently uh, published paper uh, showing that the higher levels of PFAS uh, is associated with fatty liver disease, uh, especially for alcoholic fatty liver disease or people with being overweight or have uh, higher levels of inflammation biomarker. And also there are some emerging data from laboratory or animal studies showing that PFAS can cause liver tumor in the animal model and uh, Mortality studies of PFAS exposed workers have increased the liver cancer deaths, but based on the limited study restricting to the occupational exposure. Although liver is one of the major organs for PFAS, but we don't know about uh, whether the long-term low doses uh, exposure to PFAS uh, has any impact on liver health in the general population. So to address that, I have been um, working on the year one project uh, to look at uh, to address this question. Hopefully we can generate some new insights into the relationship between PFAS and liver cancer. 
The results may help inform future uh, public policy and environmental regulations. Uh, now, I would like to touch base very briefly on my other lines of research interest on health disparity and uh, global health. As shown in this slide, a liver cancer unfortunately uh, disproportionately affects uh, diverse populations comparing to whites. As you can see from this slide, we have seen higher rate of liver cancer for African-Americans, Asian-Americans, and Hispanics. The reason being uh, underlying these uh, heart disparities in for liver cancer is largely unknown. Uh, for Asian Americans, so we know that uh, HPV uh, infection is one of the major driver. And but for other uh, different uh, diverse population, we know little. So I'm interested in uh, H. pylori infection. Uh, which is a well-established uh, carcinogen for gastric cancer. And uh, in this slide, you can see that African-Americans have significant higher median antibodies of H. pylori infection, uh, like CAG A, and one is uh, one, one of the virulent factors contributing to gastric cancer uh, compared to whites. Uh, as noted earlier, we also see a high disparity of higher liver cancer incidence for African-Americans comparing to whites. In terms of H. pylori and liver health, uh, relatively in the early stage, uh, because emerging studies uh, show that H. pylori and other helicobacter species can colonize in the human liver tissue uh, via uh, uh, different pathways. And the helicobacter species, including uh, H. pylori or, or H. bilious or hepaticus, can induce the tumor in the liver in the uh, in my, uh, mouse, my, uh, my mouse model through different molecular uh, pathways. Uh, in addition to uh, the uh, laboratory studies, we have seen some limited epidemiological studies support a role of H. pylori H. pylori infection with liver cancer. This study from the uh, NCI PLCO study found about twofold increased risk uh, between the CAG-A uh, seropositivity with liver cancer. Uh, this was study from Africa um, uh, showed about five-fold increased risk of liver cancer, but only based on 60% of uh, uh, 60 uh, cases and uh, 60 controls. Uh, I will touch upon the Africa uh, in a minute. And alcoholic fatty liver disease is a risk factor for liver cancer. In this study, uh, on the colleague, uh, Dr. McLean, also observed uh, about two or three-fold higher risk of alcoholic fatty liver disease associated with uh, H. pylori and other uh, species. I think altogether, there is a rationale to support the role of H. pylori and other species in liver tumor. We've seen, we have seen both uh, health disparities in cancer and H. pylori infection. However, we don't know much about uh, 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 the previous study are limited by uh, the sample size. No cohorts have studied the other species. And uh, another important limitation of previous studies on um, the co-infection, uh, whether the bacterial infection along with the hepatitis virus infection may confer a greater risk of uh, liver risk. So to address this knowledge gap, I have been uh, leading an NCI married award, R37, to look into uh, whether the helicobacter infection uh, and the co-infection with uh, HBSCV impact uh, the liver cancer risk in diverse population. Uh, we hope uh, to identify some risk or ethnic specific infection may be informative for uh, future interventions to reduce the disparities we have seen. Uh, now I want to move on to touch base on uh, briefly um, my efforts in the low and middle uh, income countries. This is another view of uh, looking at liver cancer globally. Uh, we just talked about the liver cancer in the US. We have seen about threefold increase uh, in incidence in the US, 
But historically, uh, U.S. has very low uh, liver cancer incidence because liver cancer uh, dispropor disproportionately affects people living in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And also we have, some study have been, uh, has projected the liver cancer and liver disease uh, in the future years. As you can see that among each of the country, they projected that liver, both liver cancer and uh, the, the blue line and the liver, oh no, the dark line, I mean, as well as the uh, liver disease uh, is increasing. Clearly, is a global concern. More concerning, as shown in this even uh, recent uh, JAMA paper, it was estimated that uh, over 16 million global cancer deaths are projected in 2040, and about 69 percent of which will work in the low and middle uh, income countries. One of which is uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So I have the, the privilege to join the Africa Capital Pancreatic Biliary Cancer Consortium serving as a co-chair for one of the epidemiology study session. Uh, my responsibility is to try to uh, design or generate some research hypothesis, uh, helping with the research design and train some uh, junior uh, uh, investigators. Uh, why interesting, I want to take uh, liver cancer as an example. Because liver cancer is more of a concern, disease concern, compared to developed regions. In Africa, liver cancer is the second most common cancer in men and third in women. And Africa, strikingly, has the youngest age of liver cancer diagnosis. The most frequent diagnosed age is about 33 to 37 years old. In, the con in contrast, in developing countries, it's such in the US, the median age of diagnosis is about uh, 65 to 70 years. So we have seen about 30 or 40 years of lag. What happened? And in addition, we have seen Africa has the highest prevalence of H. pylori infection. About 70% of them have H. pylori infection, even in the younger kids. Very striking. And also, as I mentioned to you, this is the only published study I'm aware of. Uh, uh, showing about five-fold increased risk of H. pylori and liver cancer, but based on a relatively limited uh, case and control numbers. Nonetheless, it remains unknown whether H. pylori play a role in liver health, or whether there is any specific strains of H. pylori may specifically contribute uh, to the development of uh, liver cancer or liver uh, diseases. So I'm supporting two pilot studies, one in Ghana, one in Mali. Um, uh, we hypothesize that uh, H. pylori infection is associated with the risk of developing liver cancer. And then the co-infection uh, between H. pylori and HPV confer greater risk. And put, uh, lastly, as an exploratory analysis, we would like to examine the potential interaction between H. pylori and uh, aplotoxin. If we were able to show there is a, a greater risk associated with co-infection between H. pylori and HPV, um, the significance uh, will be enormous. For example, uh, even for Africa alone, we have seen about 82 million people affected by HPV infection. Uh, if there is an interaction with H. pylori infection, clearly we can do some intervention by reducing the H. pylori infection, and this uh, treatment is available in the clinic, is affordable and accessible to most uh, population living in Africa. So now, uh, please allow me to do a quick um, summary um, of uh, today's talk. I think the strategy is to prevent liver cancer. One of the most important thing is to prevent the development uh, progression of liver diseases because the vast majority of liver cancer arises from liver diseases, uh, including uh, narcotic liver disease, NASH, or liver cirrhosis. Uh, and also at the beginning, I just mentioned the etiological landscape uh, is very different across different parts of the world. For example, in Africa, 
the vaccine, HPV vaccine remains the most important prevention uh, strategy. But currently, the uh, uptake level uh, for vaccination, HPV vaccine program is pretty low. It's about 10%. Uh, clearly, increasing the HPV vaccination uh, will make a huge impact for liver cancer, where uh, uh, the HPV infection is more prevalent, including uh, Africa and some parts of uh, uh, Asia. And also, there are many years of time uh, efforts on eliminating the mother to child transmission uh, for the HPV. Another example is aflatoxin. It's very prevalent. 40% of liver cancer are attributable to aflatoxin in Africa only. So reducing aflatoxin contamination along with HPV will have huge impact, especially we have seen about 60-fold increased risk for people with both. And then we need a, a lot of implementation signs in place regarding the blood donor screening for HPV infection, needle safety. More relevant to our today's talk, uh, I think maintaining the healthy weight, being physically active, uh, is always important. It's never too late to make the changes. Do not smoke. I didn't show that, but smoking is also a risk factor for liver cancer. People smoking have about 1.5 or two-fold increased risk. It's not as striking as lung cancer, but it's still a very important risk factor. And then it takes individuals like, uh, if you quit smoking for 15 or 20 years, you have uh, the similar risk as the general population. So never start smoking. It takes 10, 15 to 20 years to give you the risk back to the general population. Alcohol is very complicated. And we know that heavy alcohol drinking is associated with uh, the risk for sure. But now uh, uh, I think there is no clear evidence to show uh, to what uh, uh, intake range the alcohol may be uh, related to liver cancer. And there are some people say, oh, you, you drink a little bit alcohol may be good for cardiovascular disease prevention. Clearly, when we talk about alcohol, it need to be in the context of uh, the pros and cons or benefit uh, on other disease endpoints. There are also some of the studies uh, showing that even a little bit of alcohol is bad. So there are a lot of work need to be done for alcohol. But at least you, we need to limit the heavy alcohol drinking to reduce the risk of liver disease and liver uh, cancer. Eat well. We have shown a few studies like vegetables and whole grains and uh, uh, coffee, as, like emergency show yogurt uh, uh, is a protective, but we don't know much about it. But, uh, but we need to uh, be mindful about um, in the context of food as a medicine for both uh, liver cancer and liver uh, disease prevention. And then we have some preliminary data showing that uh, those healthy lifestyles can, when you look at the population to the risk for liver cancer in the US, about 60% of those liver cancer can be prevented if we were to be uh, adopting a healthy lifestyle as mentioned here. I think we need more work to identify novel risk factors. I think environmental toxins is one such of the example. And uh, I don't have much time to talk about early detection. Dr. Ma mentioned that I do have some ongoing work. I have established a cohort with uh, liver cirrhosis in the uh, hospital. Thanks to my collaborators, time and efforts in the past couple of years, we have enrolled you know, about 400 patients with liver cirrhosis. We have set up the bio bank with the, uh, the goal of contributing to the risk stratification early detection. Uh, I don't have much time to talk about uh, the uh, cancer survivorship or treatment. I know there are a lot of ongoing efforts and the uh, uh, identifying new uh, uh, treatment and maximize the quality of life. Clearly, I mean, this uh, uh, is uh, research is highly collaborative, uh, need collaborators in different fields. And also importantly, we need to help educate and training the next generation of scholars. Uh, and clearly we can work together to have um, ultimately achieve uh, the memorable and lasting reduction. None of the world has I have presented uh, uh, would not be possible if without um, the committed uh, participants for, for decades, I mean, across different institutions. And then I also have the privilege to work with a group of outstanding students 
postdoc and junior faculty to work on those projects. And, um, and I would love to uh, 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 express my uh, greatest gratitude to their help and support. And also have been likely to have some funding to, to do some of those work. Uh, I will stop here. I would love to hear your thoughts or comments and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you again for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for your very interesting presentation. Uh, the question floor is open. Uh, the people online, you can uh, you can uh, type in the chat. We'll turn on your camera so we can see uh, you. Any questions online or any question here? Uh, okay, go ahead. Uh, can you can you speak to Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, it's our privilege to hear your presentation as well. I have a few questions. Um, so in terms of um, cancer risk, um, you mentioned that there are a couple of dietary pattern studies have been conducted, including AHEI, uh, 2010 DASH diet. I'm wondering if there's any other kind of dietary pattern being conducted in this case, for example, HEI 2015 or kind of WCRF AICR scored system in relation to cancer risk. And my second question is um, in terms of cancer mortality among cancer survivors, uh, in terms of liver cancer patients, um, I'm wondering if there's any studies being conducted in terms of, you know, dietary, uh, dietary pattern or individual dietary pattern in relation to cancer mortality risk yeah. uh, among cancer survivors. Yeah. And then third question is, um, so you mentioned incorporating adolescents early screening and early treatment probably yeah. um, uh, to kind of detect the um, risk of cancer, uh, cancer risk later in life. Um, I would assume this is kind of a really long longitudinal um, cohort study with really long time follow up. Yeah. Um, but I was wondering how would you kind of foresee mm -hmm. the implication of early detection or early treatment during adolescence period um, in kind of clinical, um, clinical intervention or public health implication? Thank you. Yeah, thank you for your great questions. Uh, for your first question regarding other dietary patterns clearly are worth studying. Uh, my group has looked at uh, WCRF, ASCR dietary pattern in relation to SEC risk. We did see some uh, EMR associations. I didn't include that in the slide. Uh, we haven't looked at the AHEI uh, 2015 yet, but we'd be interested to look into that. We also derived the dietary pattern associated with diabetes. There are some publications talk about anti-diabetic uh, dietary pattern, uh, given diabetes is a strong risk factor. We have published something on that as well. Uh, regarding your second question on cancer survivorship, it's a great question. Uh, actually, my team has been uh, working with the collaborators across the US, setting up a, a cohort uh, among the patients with liver cancer. One of the questions we are interested in, exactly as you asked, whether the diet the lifestyle factors may uh, confer any uh, uh, impact on the future liver cancer patient, uh, patients of outcome. Uh, like either mortality or the disease progression. And that uh, uh, is uh, I mean, uh, really worth doing, especially given the fact that uh, with the early, more better early detection and uh, 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 efficient treatment, I would expect uh, more patients with liver cancer will have a, a better life going forward, uh, like the breast cancer or colon cancer, they live much longer. Uh, than the currently worse. So to think ahead, clearly there's a need to look into the survivorship. Uh, lastly, about the early life or life, uh, lifespan related question, I think it's more of uh, the cohorts need to be established in order to study. And also we know um, uh, it's not perfect using the questionnaire uh, to do some measurement for dietary intake in their adolescence. There are some ongoing cohorts. They have uh, collected the early life by the record uh, dietary records or questionnaire. That uh, we have some ongoing uh, projects in that field. 
Uh, but I think the, uh, although the studies are very limited in terms of uh, what the dietary factors or nutritional factors may impact liver health, but we know a lot uh, through the adulthood study. So it's never too late to convey uh, the healthy concepts of eating uh, to the early aged uh, adolescents or kids. I would guess. Regarding the early detection, uh, like I think if you can prevent the liver disease in the early uh, age, uh, uh, that will make a huge difference. Uh, uh, I think basically we are moving uh, the prevention window from the cancer to the precursors, uh, like a decade earlier. Uh, so I think it's never uh, too late to make the changes uh, uh, in that regard. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Yeah, PFAS, uh, thank you for the question. The PFAS uh, 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 can be measured in the blood. Actually, the blood is the, uh, is the, the, the only matrix to measure the PFAS. Uh, the NHS data I have mentioned very briefly, all based on the uh, blood samples uh, they collected in NHS. And uh, uh, the PFAS can be um, validated measured in the PFAS. The study was published in the CDC group, and then for this study, I'm also collaborating with uh, uh, the group of uh, CDC, some outstanding scientists who I say the PFAS levels for decades. PFAS be measured in other like uh, tissues, like hair or like the nail, what kind of things? Uh, supposedly yes, but I haven't seen much of the literature. One thing will be in the liver tissue. Uh, that could be something very interesting. I know some animal study have shown that, yeah. But the urine is not a good uh, matrix to measure the PFAS at all. Other questions? There's a question. Um, okay, Dr. Solomon, okay. Uh, you can go ahead. Ask. Thank you. I'm speaking to you from Guatemala, and I wonder if Guatemala is on your global map for liver disease. The country depends for its diet on dried corn, on maize and tortillas and tamales, as well as a high prevalence of past or active uh, helicobacteria infection. So those are two of the risk factors you mentioned. Yeah. And I, I'm embarrassed I don't know the statistics for the country I live in, but it would seem that Guatemala would be a, a country with an accumulation of risk factors for liver cancer. Thank you so much, Dr. Solomon, for a great question. Uh, my colleague, uh, the study I presented led my colleague named Dr. McLean uh, in NCI, who conducted this study in Guatemala. I personally have strong interest uh, to expanding my uh, work at policy uh, of which here, I mean, uh, nutrition has uh, outstanding resources of uh, facilitating the uh, research fundings to policy. Uh, it's, uh, it seems to me it's very uh, 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 rewarding. Uh, in fact, that's one of the goal of translating your research work uh, to impact uh, public health. So for uh, the PFAS, I mean, there are a lot of uh, uh, ongoing research from different uh, institutions looking at diverse uh, disease endpoints. We do need uh, very strong uh, evidence-based uh, uh, research findings in order to inform the regulation and policymakers. So we, hopefully one of this study can be one of them uh, contributing to that evidence uh, in that regard, yeah. Questions? We have one more <laughs> question. So, so you said that your 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 postdoc did the research show the correlation between PFAS and the fatty liver, right? And uh, so, the fatty liver also a kind of a metabolic trait associated with heart disease, type two diabetes, yeah. kind of things. Is there any uh, like I know some research on the heart disease and oncology? Yeah. 
And uh, how do you see the 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 correlation between like uh, uh, those cardiomyopathy metabolic treat like heart disease, diabetes yeah. with a uh, uh, liver cancer? Yeah, good question. Uh, as I mentioned, the liver is a major organ for metabolism, uh, detoxification. We have seen a fair amount of uh, either biomarkers or lifestyle factors or nutritional or dietary factors. If they impact the metabolic uh, dysfunction pathways or inflammation, its resistance are clearly relevant to uh, the liver health, uh, pretty uh, consistent. And then regarding uh, the, the study my postdoc has done, uh, we have stratified the population by the metabolic risk factors. We have looked, for example, one of the uh, uh, one of the conclusion from that project is that uh, the PFAS appeared to be more uh, related to liver health among the people being overweight or obese. Actually, um, people being overweight or obese, the PFAS have uh, a stronger uh, positive association. I think that speaks to the, uh, the high-risk population and the risk of stratification. Maybe a certain subgroup of population they are more likely to be susceptible to the PFAS, uh, but not all, but there's something need to be identified. Uh, hopefully that can contribute to some tailored prevention strategy going forward. Great, thank you so much. And uh, if there are no more questions, it's also about the time with many students uh, going to have a ne next class. So thank you so much again for the very interesting presentation. And uh, uh, just let you know, next week we'll still have an in-person uh, seminar. So please come and uh, we have, a, a, like I said, we have a small treat for you. 